Welcome to another episode of Life Distilled. I'm Kobe Williamson, and I'm here at Homestead Organics in the House of Ferments with Aaron Belmont. Hello, Aaron. Hey, Kobe. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming down. So, pretty excited about uh, checking out what you have going on here in, in the world of fermenting. Um, it's kind of new territory for us at Life Distilled because usually we're only focusing on that last phase of uh, making spirits. But it starts with fermentation, so it's totally applicable, and uh, you, you're doing this super small batch thing, which is right in our wheelhouse, so um, I thought it would fit really nicely, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks. I kind of mentioned it to you before we got started, but um, you know what I was doing when I started Microshiner was I had this idea that bringing things down to the local level and dealing with them right there in front of your, 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 your face and with your own hands is the best way for us to kind of move to a more resilient, more sustainable world, which I think is a huge challenge for this generation and the next two generations behind us. If we're gonna have any effect on, you know, kind of getting to a place where we're cool with the world yeah. the, and the earth is cool with us being here. Right. And so I wanted to start this, uh, you know, kind of media outlet to kind of do that and Craft Spears was just taken off. So I thought, well, here's a great uh, kind of lens um, to use to kind of talk about these issues and we could do it over a cocktail it'll be a lot of fun so we started out uh, with a blog me and my partner and then we did a magazine and then we moved into this this video venue um, with the podcast as well and when I started thinking about doing Life Distilled what I also really wanted to do was kind of um, drill down to like what is it that makes each person the happiest what's their purpose and find people who have kind of taken their lives and, and distilled their lives down to that one thing where they think they can make the most difference and they want to just like focus all their energy on. And uh, so that was kind of like the, the context mm -hmm. of how we got started here and, and what brought me basically to uh, go, hey, Aaron, what do you got going on? Yeah, that's uh, those are all important points for sure. And I think House of Ferments, or I started House of Ferments definitely with some of those things in mind of... Um, being hyper local and you know I'm interested in local food scene already um, either growing my own food or support community supported agriculture um, and CSAs and just trying keeping in mind buying local and what that actually means um, and you know enough, everything evolves with lots of parts and pieces um, and fermentation just is really interesting to me the science part of it and then also uh, kind of the art part of it too because you can be creative there's lots of different things there's basically you know the basic process of it but then from there it's kind of whatever you want to do yeah. um, as long as you understand the process there's a lot of um, opportunity for creativity right. um, and so my background is in environmental science um, I was working in the world of environmental consulting before this and you know I think this is kind of a blend of you know, some science and some creativity and I, I like both of those things. So, yeah. um, and then, yeah, just the local, um, I think that if everyone made the choice to buy local when they have the opportunity, um, small businesses can actually keep doing this. Um, it's critical. There's no way that a small business that's based on selling local can make it if no one locally is buying will right? buy their is products. They, yeah, making those choices. And yeah. I understand that those are hard choices um, for some folks and maybe for most folks. But uh, I don't know, around here it seems like we have a pretty good support system of people who seek out local stuff. Um, and I just hope that that continues. Yeah, for sure. I've mentioned it on here before and I've never really, you know, tore the band aid off of it. And it's interesting because my buddy Brian, who I do this with and he does some podcasts and put them up and he visits a lot of distilleries because he's always traveling and he's really into distilling and spirits but he lives in Healdsburg California and it, it has a very similar uh, situation as you know here in the Bitterroot Valley we could basically and they did at one time take care of themselves yeah right with their as far as their food and their wool clothing or what have right. you right you know if it, we're just talking essentials no iPhones or anything right. like that um, <laughs> You could take care of yourself here, and that's that's one of the things that I really love about where we live, right. and the opportunity I see here yeah. for the more I put into House of Ferments, the more that's going to replicate itself. 
Mm-hmm. The other thing that I just don't think gets talked about enough, and, and someday I, I was I had this retirement plan, which is I'm going to go back to college and just hang out with all the kids when I just retire, <laughs> and I'm going to work on my doctorate, because I believe that it's actually cheaper to do it this way, local, micro, um, small batch, um, as raw as possible, because when you think about it, like from the bee's per point of view or for a caveman's point of view, it does not make any sense if you take oil out of the equation to be moving right. all this stuff so far out and in back and, and this uh, idea of, um, I can't I'm lose, forgetting the term, but, but you know, if you buy a huge lot, it should be cheaper. That's right. not actually true right. in the real world, right. I don't think. Yeah, um, that's a big part of... Yeah, staying small and supporting, like being supported by your community and still and providing goods and services to your community and um, thinking about things from like how far is your food traveling, how far is whatever you're purchasing traveling before it's you. And yeah, it always boggles my mind and I think it boggles a lot of people's minds is like price differences and like, oh, well, I can get it cheaper over here. But it, what is the real cost of that? Because where did it actually come from? And how? And I don't understand how things end up being that inexpensive given where they've come from and right. how many hands have touched them and just the all that process of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's going to be my uh, doctoral thesis at yeah. some point because I'd like to get to the bottom of that question because I honestly, like you just alluded to, I don't think the math works out. It, yeah, some I, cost is being pushed aside uh, somewhere. Subsidized somehow or something. And it's, yeah. I've been thinking about that a lot as far as like, you know, we're growing a little bit, scaling up and how to do that. And, you know, are you going to, will we be able to decrease our costs a little bit? Um, because there's this whole, f- sometimes I feel the need to compete a little bit with like the commercial brands that are out there, yeah. which is impossible I mean it's impossible to be this small and um compete price-wise with commercial producers and I don't know they're working on a much larger scale and somehow they're making it cheaper that way and I just I don't understand that but yeah I'm not a business person (laughs) I can ferment things (laughs) and I love being in the kitchen I love doing the fermentation part of it I love talking to people and doing like the education stuff the business side of things is um, definitely one of my weak points, but, you know, learning every day and figuring things out. But that, yeah. 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 It's interesting. It is. I, I just find it fascinating. It's a conversation point with distillers for me all the time. I always say, hey, when you guys go into this, um, you have to think about what is your maximum scale. Right. And then figure out how you can amortize those capital costs. Right. Knowing you're only going to be this big. Yeah. Because there's a guy right over there that's doing the same thing. Right. And if you think you're going to compete on price point with the big guys, it's impossible it's because impossible. they've already automated yeah. and they already have the capital right. to automate. So they're not paying anybody. So you have to focus on a different value proposition. And what is that? Because yeah. I'm willing to pay more if I know it's going to somebody in my community right. who's then going to have kids at the soccer game that's right. also going to pay to have the soccer yeah. thing exist. Totally. Just you know. the whole community. Yeah, I agree. And I think... Just talking about it and having people understand that, you know, it's not just one purchase or something, you know, like that, um, there's a domino effect that happens. Yeah. Um, we yeah. call it, we call it the small batch lifestyle. Yeah. And we, uh, we, that's, that's what we're here to do is promote that. Right. We right. think that uh, the more people do that, you know, so, um, as much as I love your stuff and I'm going to probably love it more after we try some. Right. I don't necessarily want somebody in Phoenix, Arizona buying House of Ferments. Right. I want them buying Phoenix Ferments. Phoenix, yeah, totally. I completely Because there's an errand somewhere there right. that needs a job, and needs to provide in her community and the I same things. And I think with the live fermented foods and beverages, like the kind of stuff that I'm doing, I think that, you, you know, you're going to get more benefit from not just uh, from eating it locally. Like the cabbage I'm, that's in the kraut is grown in the bitter. Uh-huh. You know, um, and some of the fruits and vegetables that go into flavoring the kombuchas are grown in the bitter. Um, and so you're getting everything from right here, from where you are. And like, it's the bacteria and the yeast that are native to where you are. Um, and I think that that's going to help your system. Um, uh, cause 
that's what you're surrounded by. That's your environment. For and sure. so you're becoming a little bit more in tune with your, your environment that way. Yeah. Oh, I, I like what you're saying. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense to me. So you're doing environmental science. How did you, like, was it like everybody else? And in 2008, you got laid off and you're like, what am I going to do with myself? <laughs> no. My gosh, no. Uh, I actually just left a really good job. <laughs> Super stable. Um, I think that, uh, I don't kind of goes back to what you're talking about a little bit, like distilling life down a little bit. Um, I had, you know, went to school, got a, just a bachelor's of science in environmental science. I've been working in the field of restoration pretty much since I got out of school. Um, did a bunch of tree planting and then got into like consulting. I was working um, for a super small company here in Hamilton, um, doing a lot of riparian restoration stuff. And I mean, I'd been there for a decade and like it sounds, might sound a little silly, but I, I think I just was starting to get burnt out. Uh, I was working a lot. Um, and then, you know, always trying to have a life on the side um, and still pursuing other interests. And for, you know, I'd been doing f weird fermentation things for a while, like making meat or wine or whatever. Um, and then started it into, with kombucha and the krauts and doing all this stuff. And it just kind of like took over. And like I had a lot of kitchen pets and it was just all around me. And I was spending a lot of time doing that. And... Uh, I think it just got to a point where I was like, all right, well, I'm really passionate about this. I should just, I either need to dial this down and stick with what I'm doing where I'm, you know, kind of burnt out or follow a passion and see where it goes. Um, and so that's what I did and it's super scary, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but it's, yeah. it's been a great journey so far. I've only been in business officially like two years. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's been kind of non-stop but really great I mean I can still I am my own boss so I have no one to complain about <laughs> but uh I do get to knock off when I want to and go fishing or go to the river and attend to other life things and I think that that's really important yeah oh yeah. I think so yeah I think uh obviously you know it's a big conversation point anymore but you know that work-life balance but I really think it's more about your life. Just there isn't supposed to be these lines. Right. It's supposed to be integrated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're, I spent a season in Alaska and I just, a takeaway from the natives was, um, I had this native lady working for me in the dispatch center doing wildland fire dispatch, uh, wildland fire management. And she called me one day, even though we were kind of busy and was like, Hey, I need to go to the river, the fisher run. And I was like, okay. And then my supervisor, the head forester there, was like, oh, I'm tired of hiring that woman. She never, always ditches and on us and stuff. And I said, well, but she can go and in three days catch an entire winter's worth of food and stock the freezer for the whole winter. Or she can stay here and make $300. Right. It's a no-brainer. And spend that half, you know, like yeah. not in the same way. Right. Yeah. And so I just... Uh, I just, I, I like what you're saying. I um, appreciate what you did and the, and the leap of faith that you took. Because I do think it just, it needs to be us doing what we're, what we're good at, what we really want to do. Right. And uh, blur those lines. A lot yeah. More. And like, I had a good job and I enjoyed what I was doing too. Yeah. You yeah. know, so it wasn't like I left something that I wasn't super passionate about also. Um, I just like variety, I guess. And sure. like, I, like I was saying before, I've dabbled in other things in the meantime, you know, did some um, film stuff and uh, like some education with the film stuff and just and I'm, I was always trying to do my consulting job and something else at the same time and I finally realized that like to you know to fully dive into something like and you have to commit to that yeah. you know and so I yeah I did it and sour was it sour was it yeah right. <laughs> and I just you know at the fermentation it's just fascinating there's a whole cultural aspect that I think is really interesting and could be revived. Um, you know, so, just thinking back to like how people used to preserve their food. I mean, fermentation was it. That's before canning, before refrigeration. Yeah. Um, well, so I know nothing about the past or the, the, the where this came from. So can you right. tell us all a little bit um, about... 
Well, I mean, the history of fermentation. Yeah, and, and a little bit, I guess. Um, I mean, there's whole books, you know, right. you can like read about it. But I think in general, like every culture, um, since the beginning of people have been fermenting something in one way or another, whether it was first by mistake and then um, on purpose. Mm -hmm. Beer, obviously, you know, breads, um, people have been fermenting grains, you know, it's just people figuring out the best way to eat something. Uh, if you ferment certain grains, you know, they're more digestible. Um, they, they remove toxins that are potentially there. Um, it is a uh, faster cooking times once you, you know, ferment something, um, with the grains, you know, and I think that yeah, so it's just people figuring out how to survive. Yeah. You know, um, uh, people like native people in Alaska taking that um, three day window of catching the fish for the whole winter and then what do they, you know, burying it in the ground and eating it when they can't go fishing or they can't go hunting or, you know. Um, and then people in uh, more tropical climates where, sure, you can grow food all the time, but it rots really fast. And so basically, creating food, um, putting food in a selective environment so that it ferments instead of rots, basically, yeah. you know, so it's a delicacy instead of something that's kind of gross, yeah. um, in a way to just, um, take advantage of the bounty when there is bounty. Um, and that's just, yeah. And, you know, Eastern European cultures, obviously with sauerkrauts and, um, you know, and all different cultures brought all that stuff to this country too and continue to do it. And I have customers at market all the time who are like, oh, my grandma used to, or my dad did that in the backyard in a bucket. And, you know, and people have memories. Um, but they don't, they didn't follow those traditions. Like mm -hmm. they kind of fell away at some point. Right. Um, well, you so, could get it for a dollar uh, right. in a can. <laughs> in a can, right. I mean, there's a lot of, weird food revolutions that have happened, you know, out yeah. of, um, convenience, right. um, that aren't really convenient and take more resources and more time and, um, to produce those things maybe and put it in a can and seal it up and sell it. And yeah, I just think kind of bringing, uh, some of those traditions and ways of doing things back into our common knowledge and practice. I mean, fermentation is something fermented vegetables you can do at home you know small super small batch style and it's rewarding and it's fun and i mean a lot of people that's why i do i do workshops sometimes because uh -huh. i think people want to try things but oh, they yeah. get nervous right or they don't have the confidence and so i love helping people build that confidence of like i can do this myself you know yeah and i'm banking on the fact that they'll try it and won't continue it and then they'll just buy my stuff there you go <laughs> i like it yeah so, and then kombucha is really interesting. Um, there's lots of theories out there of like where it started. Uh, nobody really knows for sure. Um, I think a lot of people think it was probably from a tea drinking culture. Uh, so somewhere in Asia, probably China, maybe, you know, there's lots of theories out there. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody actually knows. Right. Um, and then kombucha is just fascinating in that there is a culture that grows on the top that ferments the tea and it's yeast and bacteria that work together and there's a lot of um kind of mystery science in there too like i don't think anyone really has the full process like figured out yeah um which makes it interesting which also makes it really cool as to why you would want to drink local kombucha because all kombucha is different um yeah you can go to the store and get some stuff that's pretty consistent but I question that. Like, is that really what it's supposed to be? Like, uh -huh. I don't know. My One of my new mottos I came up with was um, uh, always good, never the same. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think a lot of times consumers want some consistency. Like, oh, I'm getting this brand because it tastes like this and they know that. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to help people break out of that. Like, it's going to be good. It might not be the exact same as you got last time, but you're going to like it. Uh-huh. <laughs> hopefully yeah, yeah yeah i don't i mean that's just fun food should be fun like it shouldn't be the same all the time uh i don't know i struggle with that because i think a lot of people are in that mindset but yeah i believe they are i mean you see it with uh with whiskey and, and spirits 
that's that's the first and foremost thing on people's mind. How can I get this consistent so that when they grab a bottle off the shelf, they right. know it's going to taste like Jack Daniels every right. single time. Right. And I don't think that that's the point. I'm I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, I think you want to have a lot more flexibility in your life. And, and I think I mean kombucha. It's a, these are all natural and like um, what am I trying to say? There's a lot of variables, mm-hmm. right? Like uh, the there's so many variables. So how even just the culture that's growing could be different from batch to batch. It's the same culture, but it's you know you're dealing with a living organism, right. and so to control that down to a point where you know it's going to be exactly the same every time, that to me seems pretty impossible. Mm-hmm. And anyone that says that like they're doing it and it's still you know completely you know not pasteurized or um, raw and all, I'm like, I don't know how they're doing it, right? And having a completely consistent product. It's a living organism. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to control. <laughs> I'm not, like, I don't really try. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a pack of Siberian Huskies and they're impossible to control. Right. So I, and two boys. And yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. So, so some Just, yeast that I can't even communicate with, that's even right, more challenging. Right. I think that'll be difficult. And bacteria. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you're making kombucha. Yeah. You're making some other... Uh, vegetable ferments, yeah, sauerkrauts, different kinds of krauts, kimchi, and I do some uh, ex- super small experimental batches uh, all the time, trying to just, I mean, a farmer is like, hey, I have 300 pounds of kohlrabi, do you want to do something with it? And I'm like, it's super hard for me to be like, no, I'm, I'm good, <laughs> even though I am, and I probably don't have the capacity, but I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll try it. So I have I got some kohlrabi kraut fermenting right now that I haven't tried yet. Who knows? We'll find out. That's exciting. Um, but yeah, it's super fun to try new stuff and try out new recipes. And um, it's a struggle to like maintain doing, being consistent mm-hmm. in the fact that I have some stuff that I always do offer. Right. Um, but then always trying to do new stuff too. Um, yeah. Because that's just fun. Yeah. I dig it. Well, yeah. We... Do you want to try some stuff? We should. Okay. Where do you want to start? Uh, well, it's up to you. Um, we have a couple different flavors of kombucha, um, and then we've got some different kinds of kraut and kimchi. I mean, I figure this is a beverage show, kind of, so maybe we should start with the kombucha. Yeah. I Unless you want should. to start with a brine shot, which is uh, yeah, the brine from the krauts. I what? do sell brine shots at market, and it's becoming... Uh, What's the purpose thing. of that? Uh, basically, the, it's just the liquid from the different krauts and kimchi. Uh-huh. Uh, you can eat drink it it's kind of restorative I like to drink it uh, either ex- after exercising or drinking it's a kind of a hangover hookup gotcha um, especially after exercising and drinking right um, uh, yeah and so it's just I like and it's also good for like marinades or dressings um, yeah give me yeah. a little, little okay. sample this is just from the classic so it's pretty it's the, probably the most mild uh huh um, I think if I can get this one Oh gosh. Oh, brain shot for you. Just a mini. Cheers. Cheers. I shouldn't let you drink alone, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was kind of frightened. That that was <laughs> that's totally doable. Yeah. That's good. Okay, it's always good to start with a brain shot. Uh, yeah. I just like to get people into weird things, I guess. Wake me um, up a little bit. What kind of, oh, and I did get some uh, Prosecco because this is a spirit show and I didn't want you to have to do a whole show dry. <laughs> well, thanks for that. So we can ha- try some different kombuchas and then we can make a, a shambucha, like a, it's like a mimosa, but with a kombucha. Very cool. It's delicious. Uh, yeah, your pick. I got lavender, ginger, uh, vanilla beet, cucumber, traditional, and currant. Well, you have the lavender open. Okay. Let's give it a try. Okay. I'm just going to do little ones. If you want to try them all, then... Yeah, please. Okay. Um, Great. So, I mentioned before uh, when we were chatting that I had come to your booth once and I got a uh, kombucha. Mm-hmm. And as I, after I left there and went back to my desk, I realized I was kind of buzzing a little bit. I don't know whether it was... Uh, <laughs> don't say that. Um, the tea, you know, the caffeine in right. the tea, or, or... Or the kombucha. The kombucha um, or... I'm hoping it's not the kombucha, so I'm... Suppo- I'm it's supposed to be non-alcoholic. Um, I send samples in, um, and they have mm-hmm. to come back below 0.5. Okay. 
sure. so I have to be NA. Um, you know, I know there is another kombuchery in uh, there in Bozeman, and they actually got their brewer's license, um, and they do all kinds of different things. They're also sandwiched in between a brewery and a distillery, and like have lots of resources to collaborate and stuff. It's a really great thing. Um, and then, you know, it's an, it's an option, I think, a road to go down. Um, but I, I do like being able to provide a non-alcoholic, like a beverage that's fun to drink that is non-alcoholic, but is also a great mixer. So if you want to have that element, it's there too. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of my best market customers are kids. Like they love it. They love kombucha. Um, there is such a thing as like a tea buzz. Mm -hmm. And so like being tea drunk kind of, uh, I've read some stuff on that and like the, I get my tea from Lake Missoula Tea Company up in Missoula, and they have a blog, and they wrote a whole thing on um, tea, tea, being tea drunk, like you can. And yeah, it yeah. is like a... Did it, it didn't last long, though, did it? No. No, yeah. it was very mild, and I mean, uh, there's caffeine still in the tea, right? Yeah, there is caffeine. Um, it's supposed to be less than like drinking an actual cup of tea. Okay. Um, I do use a blend of green tea and black tea, but it's, it's mostly green tea. Um, but it's, it's a really nice, uh, yeah, organic heritage green tea that I get from Lake Missoula, but yeah, so it was the caffeine. Yeah, well, <laughs> it could very well have been. And it could have just be me and my perceptions because I'd never drank kombucha really before right. that. One time I bought a bottle at the store. Right. Um, you know, I'm not so sure about store kombuchas right. myself, I, but. Yeah, I always encourage people to, Keep trying kombucha until they find one they like because all kombuchas are really different. Yeah. Um, whether that's like different local ones, the commercial ones, um, they're all really, really different. My kombucha tends to be uh, more on the dry side, so not sweet. Um, I like it, personally, I like it really tangy. Um, that's been something I've tried to kind of figure out. Like what I like isn't necessarily what all, everyone is gonna like yeah. um, and just finding that balance of like pleasing myself and also pleasing my customers like that's important you know I want people to enjoy what I'm making absolutely yeah um, so yeah that was the lavender the lavender was cool um, I liked it I like that it's dry I yeah. always like dry and everything dry ciders dry wines right me too um, so I appreciate the, the dryness of it yeah and that lavender just there at the end you know yeah, it's, uh, at first you not, don't quite notice it, and then after a while you're like, oh yeah, not my too mouth tastes like that lavender bush that I walked past in the garden. Overpowering. Um, let's just we'll just go down the line. I don't know. We could do the traditional. We're gonna do the Viva La Beat. It's a uh, vanilla beet. Oh. Wow. Um, I call it Viva La Beat because the first batch I made was, uh, I think like when Castro died and so the Viva La is kind of, I don't know. Yeah. It's like, I usually don't name my kombuchas. I just call them whatever the flavor is. Right. But sometimes that gets a little boring too, so. You know, that's a whole thing. I would like to see the database of all the beer names out there <laughs> oh my because God. how are people even Coming still, up with stuff, I, I think know. about that with bands too. Right. How are there still new, I mean, House of Ferments is now a band because <laughs> we only have so many words. Right, right. Yeah. So the vanilla beet is interesting. Um, it's one of my favorites, but um, it's interesting because I make a, it's like a double ferment. Um, I make beet kvass, which is basically like fermented beets juice, kind of. Um, and I use the beet kvass to flavor the kombucha. Gotcha. Um, and so that's a fermented product then going in as a flavoring. And so that's just kind of fun. And then I make like, yeah. And then there's vanilla in there too. Just like a vanilla tea. And I never ate beets. Um, I only recently started to eat beets because we started growing them mm -hmm. and they grew really well in our garden here. And so I started, but I really find that beets taste like the earth. Yeah, beets taste me. like dirt. Yeah, yeah they really I do. love it. And uh, I, I can feel, I can taste that. I didn't want to say it without the little prelude, but I can, I can taste that in it here. Like I mean, it beets. tastes like beets. Yeah. Um, not that that's a bad thing, right. but it definitely does. You have to like beets to like this flavor kombucha, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, I think it looks pretty in the jar, too. Mm -hmm. And this is actually one of my favorite no, ones. Oh, really? Um, the color is amazing. Yeah, to mix uh, with, like, Prosecco or Champagne. It makes it really nice. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, so As you were saying, um, 
And I think you mentioned that you may work with a distillery that's opening here in town yeah. at some point. But I could see that being used in the mm-hmm. cocktail mixer um, and really to great effect. Yeah, it's been fun to chat with those uh, those folks over there. I'm excited for when they open. They're going to be featuring uh, kombucha cocktails. Mm-hmm. And I've been trying since I've been in business to get bars and restaurants to kind of go down that road. And it's yeah. been a struggle to get people to use kombucha as a mixer uh, I'm not quite sure why but um, I do it all the time I got mm-hmm. home uh, yeah I make kombucha cocktails all the time they're delicious well from the bar management I've never been one but my my partner Brian was one and uh, from their perspective you know it's just about minimizing all of the chaos behind there so oh, one sure. more one more right. variable one more option just makes things challenging totally which is probably why like a distillery is a great place for yeah. them to be able to do it because it's it's just a different atmosphere than you're a coming in bar. there with the idea that you're going right. to try stuff, and there's mixologists and creative people behind right. the behind the bar. Um, that one's just the traditional, so it's just straight kombucha, not flavored. Also, one of my favorites, just because I actually like the taste of kombucha. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there's a lot of kombucha out there that doesn't even taste like kombucha. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I actually like the way it tastes. Where do you get the yeast from, and then bacteria? So what's what's the start of the process yeah so um i actually got my first scoby from a friend of mine scoby um stands for symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast um i thought it was just a play on my name (laughs) (laughs) but that's kind of fun Mm -hmm. um yeah, and so that's just kind of how com- like the, the scobies, people call them mothers or whatever, they get passed around from okay. one person to another. A friend of mine was making kombucha, and um, she gave me a scoby. I start making it at home. Kitchen pet, kitchen pet, it takes over. Yeah, now I have huge ones in the other room. Um, right. And, and you so mentioned you, just, you were using these crocs that are behind me? Here. I use the crocs for the vegetable ferments. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I have some stainless steel tanks uh, just over there uh, in the other room for gotcha. the kombucha. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Um, and they just, it, yeah, if you feed it, it grows. It's sort of, yeah, mm-hmm. like a gremlin. Uh, I like that one. Yeah, the that's tri- just the traditional. The triad is, is, mm-hmm. is right on. Mm-hmm. I think we should do a vegetable. Okay. Before I get too filled up with okay. liquid here. Yeah. Right? Um, Maybe mix and match a little bit. Right, right. Uh, do you like spicy? Do you... I'm are you willing more to, of a classic kind of guy? Uh, I probably trend classic. Okay. I, I tip that way probably. Okay. Well, we can just try the um, classic style sauerkraut, which yeah. is green cabbage and caraway. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah. so you're saying this is kind of from Eastern Europe? I, yeah, you know, it seems like a lot of like people... Have, like Russian, Polish, German descent um, seem to, yeah, feel free. I'll just dose you a little there. I'll eat some with you. Oh, yeah, that's great, Aaron. Hmm, thanks. Again, not something I ever tried as a kid. You know, I'm sure I tried it and was like, oh my lord, no. Uh, but I really, I was chatting with somebody about this just the other day. In that it, it must be that your taste buds and things kind of change over time as you get older. Because some things just taste so strong as a kid. Like right. an olive or what have you. Yeah. Brussels and then later, sprouts. yeah, you're like, oh, right. no, these are, these, are, these are pretty good. Yeah, And then you sure. start even like them even more. So like, I really dig sauerkraut now. Yeah. Well, and I think like sauerkraut... I'm sure, at least when I was a kid, the kraut that I had was, yeah, like from a can or something. And it was just limp just mush, and yeah. looked weird. And yeah, I mean. No, that's the first thing I noted about this is, I mean, the cabbage, all of, all the structure's still there. It hasn't, you know, wilted or Yeah, it's whatever. crunchy. Yeah. yeah. I like crunchy kraut. Nice. I mean, sometimes, you know, it won't come out as crunchy but the flavor is, I mean, that's it. Fermented foods are, they're just great because they're super versatile. You can eat them. Like the kraut is super versatile. You can eat it in a lot of different ways. I think a lot of people get stuck on the whole brat thing mm-hmm. where like it just, right. you put kraut on a brat and that's it. But um, there's all kinds of dishes and um, as a side dish, uh, right out of the jar, as, you know, I eat kraut and kimchi for breakfast, like on my eggs or something for breakfast. 
Yeah, I can um, see an omelet. And work yeah, out really nice yeah, or just like an egg sandwich, just like yeah. um, mm-hmm. grilled cheese sandwiches. It's like one of my favorite things. <laughs> like kraut cheese sandwiches oh, wow. are delicious. Uh, there's lots of things like fish tacos, regular tacos. Yeah, you know, or the kimchi like as a side to any stir fry. I mean, yeah, it's just lots of fun things to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you want to try the uh, yes, little, little Polish girl? I do. It's the purple cabbage uh-huh. um, with a little bit of carrot and apple. Oh, cool. Yeah. Let's set that one aside there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I did just get fancy new labels that I'm really excited about. Yeah. Um, They're beautiful. In, in living color, these were like an example of how the old ones looked. Um, and a friend of mine, uh, did the logo and then, yeah, I had another friend help me with, uh, just the new design for the label and I also worked with a company out of Livingston to have the labels designed and printed. Um, so yeah, back to like the staying local thing. I try really hard to not, yeah, keep all of it as, you know, local as I can. You got it. Yeah. I mean, obviously the jars come from somewhere else, but they're still made in the U.S. at least. So, you know, it's just, it's definitely a process to like think about all those things in every step of what, what I'm doing Uh Um, and and try to stay true to that. Um, But it's kind of important to me. So I can't remember what was this guy goes here. So the little Polish girl tends to be a little sweet like sweeter than the other ones because there is some apple in there um but it's also pretty tangy yeah um, that's so what that's i was good. noticing yeah it's really tangy which yeah. i like yeah good I'm, I'm afraid of it staining my trousers but uh, otherwise. yeah i do a lot of things <laughs> that stain <laughs> like anything with beets or purple cabbage or the kimchi <laughs> i sometimes when i'm making stuff well, i'll wear like a coverall like coveralls yeah um, Smart move. Yeah. Um, I'm just a slob, so I get food right. on myself all the time. <laughs> ginger, uh, maybe? Ginger? You want to try ginger? Yeah, kombucha? please. Yeah. Ginger is kind of a no-brainer for the kombucha. I don't know why. It just yeah. goes really well. Everybody loves ginger, kombucha. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people do. And um, Yeah. It's a great... It's also a great... Yeah, it's one of the ones that's a good mixer for... Any yeah. kind of drink, like yeah, just rye whiskey as... and ginger is like my go-to. Oh, right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, as soon as I smelled it, I was like, okay, that, that would make a cocktail right there. Mm-hmm. The other thing I think about ginger is all, like when people are looking at a big lineup of, of flavors and they're not going to just try it, they're like, okay, I've already had the regular one. What would be another flavor? Ginger is just something that they know is most likely going to be pretty good. Right. It's a... It's a the characteristic flavor that yeah. you just know what you're getting into. Yeah, sometimes the like purple stuff, you know, ones that are a different color throw people off and they make people a little nervous, I think, but no. That's got some zing to it though. Mm. The yeah. ginger. Yeah, yeah. I dig it. I like ginger a lot. So. Yeah, I try to, and like every batch comes out a little different, even though I am, I do try for some consistency. Sure. But uh, yeah, every batch comes out a little different. So I like uh, I like what you said about um, it's consistently good. Yeah, always uh, good, never the same. Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a great way to come at it. I think that uh, that that's really the selling point there. Yeah, I yeah. Think, I think people should embrace that uh, that little catchphrase. Right, that's a good one. Um, what else you want to do? I've got the uh, yeah. Sammy Star sauerkraut. It's got. Uh, green cabbage and carrot base and it's spiced with um, paprika, peppercorns, and oregano. Oh yeah, we want to try that. Um, This is my original, which is also green cabbage and carrot, uh, but it's spiced with garlic, ginger, and a little bit of cayenne, Mm. which is uh, one of my favorites and a pretty good seller as well. The kimchi is probably our best seller, which is fascinating to me. I never would have thought um, that kimchi would have been our best seller. Um, when, and when I first started House of Ferments, I wasn't even planning on doing vegetables. I was really just going to do the kombucha. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I don't know, it just snowballed, I guess. Yeah. And it's House of Ferments, so it's like, you know, 
everything. Yeah, we need a few more right. fermented items in the, um, in the house. And then you did the classic, the mm -hmm. Polish girl, then these guys. And then this is a fennel kraut, um, super small batch that I just made first time a couple, yeah, a month or so ago. So Too cool. Yeah. Well, I would definitely like to try the Sammy Star. Yeah, and then I have to do the kimchi because... Okay, yeah. I, I'm actually not that surprised that the kimchi is such a good seller just because it's hard to find kimchi. And I'm sure people go, well, I could go to the store and for a buck and a half get some sauerkraut right. by the gallon, but there is no kimchi at the store. So um, I'm not surprised, but Ooh, at the same time. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have to ask for seconds, too. <laughs> Thank you. This one, I think, is just like a Greek sandwich topper, um, hence the name Sammy Star. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of people are confused by that, but... <laughs> um. Yeah, I think it's a good thing when you can hear someone eating kraut. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's one of the things you're shooting for, I can tell. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's always just interesting that starting out with like a same base, green cabbage and carrot, and then spicing it differently makes completely different flavors and different tang factor. And I mean, how long you ferment something definitely plays into that. Um, the, yeah, people always ask how long I ferment stuff, and I always say it's dependent on like the temperature and the batch size because I am fermenting. Uh, I don't have temperature control rooms or anything, um, so it's always different depending on the time of year, kind of yeah. how long it takes. Um, right. When it's warmer, things ferment faster. Um, so do you bury, bury it out in the backyard? Like <laughs> I, I saw a mash that one time. <laughs> right, that, a lot of people ask me that actually. Right? Um, it's interesting. I get. Uh, a lot of veterans that will come by at market, or I don't get a lot, but when veterans come by, the way a lot of them are either, it's either, oh my, you have kimchi, give me some, mm -hmm. or the complete opposite of like, they just give me this look of like, you have kimchi, and they, they're just like, I don't want to touch that stuff, like, get me away, I spent time somewhere, and no. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I think we ought to uh, pop the cork on that <sighs> thing. If we're gonna do that, we should do it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know. Yeah. Right. It's, it's that perfectly that time. Right. It's just like you know five o'clock. It's noon somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Look. Well, I think that's interesting. I just finished writing a piece um, about. It, it was basically the premise of it is is that you know alcohol is a food. It's it's just like you were saying about the fermented foods. It's been a part of ancient peoples and us, you know, throughout time. And that really what the um, the driving force in craft beer exploding and craft spirits exploding really is not um, that people's tastes are changing or that people are more interested in trying all these new things. But really that we're all looking to get back to these core values, core processes, core constructs that we know are what civilization is based on. Um, and that uh, that's what's really driving it and the price of oil. Right. <laughs> because it's uh, really interesting that if you look at the number of breweries and distilleries that exist in America, that line of how many there are mm -hmm. tracks exactly with what the price of a barrel of oil is. And it also tracks pretty close because the oil price and the un and unemployment right. track together as well. Right. So Fascinating. if oil goes up, right. about nine months later, unemployment goes super high. And then they'll fall. Huh. And whenever unemployment goes up, breweries and distilleries right. and house of fermenties and all those things just go through right. the roof. Yeah, um, Fascinating. Because people look back and go, wait a minute, I can... I can make beer myself. I'm going to do something. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I need to make some use of myself. Right. And this right. is just costing me money when it could be making right. money right. at it. So right. let's right. start a brewery. Try something, right? Uh, what's your uh, flavor for the... I think we should do the traditional. All I, right. You, nice. I think you said that was a... Traditional is great. Kind of the route you did. I like them all. I mix them all. All sure. the time. So 
And feel free to, uh, you know, make your own proportion here. Yeah, I'll give it a try. Yeah. I'm probably going to do the, the vanilla beet. Or the currant. The currant's really yummy. All the currants just came in. I um, they're grown at uh, yeah, that one will stain too. Yeah. The ag station in Cordalis. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, was that? I want to get yeah. more on the program sometime mm -hmm. and talk about some things. It's super. The currant is like currant. It's kind of tangy. Oh and, yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Well, may I talk you out of a little kimchi here? Oh yes. I would like to try that. Mm-hmm. Before we run out of time here. Yeah. Um, I feel like I was going to say something I forgot what it was. Oh, yeah. That's, okay. It's actually more subtle than I thought. I mean, you set me up a little bit, so <laughs> maybe that's why. It finishes pretty tangy, though. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. there's definitely a... It lingers along for mm -hmm. a bit. Mmm. Mmm, cheers. That's delicious. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cheers, man. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah.